A while back I reviewed the movie version of Shirai-san, which was adapted from one of my favourite books of the same name. The movie, despite starting out almost word for word exactly the same, was quite a departure by the end, and it skipped entirely over all my favourite aspects of the book. So, I decided to read it again, so this time I could review the book itself instead. And here we are. In this video, I'm going to not just review the book, but actually dive into the plot and explain what's going on and some of the fascinating lore behind it. Shirai-san is a fantastic story, but sadly, unless you can read Japanese, it's rather inaccessible to most right now. So, let's delve deep into this fascinating urban legend from one of my favourite authors and look at a story that is basically, what if Dingu, but written by Otsuichi as a knee channel creepypasta. Intrigued? Great. This video will obviously contain spoilers. We're diving in deep and fully exploring everything, including the ending. With that said, let's head on in. Shirai-san, at its most basic, is a story about a group of people battling an urban legend that's out to kill them. That urban legend is referred to as Shirai-san, although it's unknown initially where her name comes from or what it even means. It's also unknown who or what Shirai-san herself really is. She seems to act like a spirit, appearing and disappearing at will, and haunting people she has targeted, but she's also incredibly unspirit-like at times. She seems to follow hard rules, and can't break those. She also has a rather unique look, appearing as a woman with unnaturally large eyes, wearing a white kimono, with a piece of red string threaded through her hands. Yes, literally through. With a bell attached. It's generally this bell that signifies she is nearby, and if you don't yet have a fear of bells ringing, you might after this. The book opens with our main character, Yamamura Mizuki, a university student who's rather shy and unable to look people in the eyes, having coffee with her friend Kana in a cafe. They're telling scary stories, as young women often do in cafes, I suppose, but before long, Kana starts to freak out. She sees something in the distance that Mizuki can't see, and whatever it is, it's getting closer. Kana tries desperately to escape this invisible threat, but then suddenly, she drops dead. It's all so sudden that Mizuki has no idea what's going on, and she soon realises that she's covered in her friend's blood. Kana's eyes exploded, and there's now nothing there but gaping, bloody caverns where her eyes once were. What in the actual? A few days later, Mizuki is approached by a young man around the same age as her at university. He wants to know more about Kana's death, as does everyone it seems, because she died rather gruesomely in a public place, and everyone knows Mizuki was with her when she died. But this man is different. His name is Suzuki Haruo, and as it turns out, his brother Kazuto also died in the same way the day before. Even stranger, it turns out that Kazuto was friends with Kana, and they worked together at the same bookstore as part-timers. Haruo was able to figure all of this out through Facebook, and he heard the rumours of Kana's eyes exploding when she died. Turned out the same thing happened to his brother. Clearly, there is something strange going on here, and he wants to figure out what. His brother called him moments before his death, and screamed at something to stay away, yet he was found alone inside his locked apartment. This reminds Mizuki of Kana screaming at something invisible. What is the connection here? Again, Thanks to Facebook, the pair tracked down a third party, Tomita Eiko, another part-timer from the same bookstore who went on a trip with both Kazuto and Kana to a hot spring roughly a week earlier. She's still alive, so maybe she knows what's going on. However, she hasn't shown up to work recently, so they fear that if they don't get to her in time, then maybe she'll die too and they'll lose their best chance at uncovering what's going on. Eiko agrees to meet the pair once she realises they're related to Kazuto and Kana, and she reveals that 
the trio heard a particular scary story from a man named Watanabe at the Sogen Hot Spring in Y City, F Prefecture. It sounds silly, but Eiko fears it was this story that is now killing them. How could that be? Well, the results speak for themselves, don't they? And ever since she heard that story, Eiko has been experiencing a variety of strange hauntings. Occasionally, she smells something like rotten fish, hears creaking in the house, despite the fact she is home alone, and she even sees shadowy figures out the corner of her eye. All of this began after they heard that story at the hot spring. And what story was it? Well, it's rather simple. A man was walking down the road. It was a rather dense mountain road, and as he walked through the dim light, he suddenly heard the ring of a bell coming from somewhere. What was that? The man thought and turned around. Right behind him stood a woman with strangely large eyes. She was so creepy that the man took off running, but the woman maintained pace behind him. Unable to bear it any longer, the man stopped and asked her why she was chasing him. Because you know about me, she answered. Who the hell are you? The man screamed, and then the woman told him her name. Shidai-san. Shidai-san? The man repeated. Yes, that's right. I chase after people who know about me. And then, I kill them. Stay away, the man screamed. Don't come any closer. Surely there are other people who have heard your name too. Go chase them instead. Please. There have to be others, right? Others who have heard your name. Others who have heard my name? The woman repeated. Ah, yes. There are. They're right there. With this, the storyteller points at the listeners and delivers the final terrifying blow. And you will be next. The story is a typical, once you've heard it, now you are cursed as well, type of scary story. And naturally, the three friends didn't think much of it at the time. At least, until they actually started dying. First Kana, and then Kazuto. And although she doesn't yet know, Watanabe, the man who told them the story in the first place, also died several days before Kana. That means, without a doubt, that Eiko is next. And she so fears that the story is real that she refuses to mention the name when she retells it to Haruo and Mizuki. But, also unbeknownst to her, one more person heard the story. Morikawa Toshiyuki, a staff member at the hot spring, who was on front desk duty at the time and overheard the group talking. At any rate, Eiko tells Haruo and Mizuki that she'll put on some tea and leaves the room. Before long, the kettle can clearly be heard boiling, and yet it continues unabated. Worried, the pair get up to look for Eiko and find her trying to hang herself. She just can't bear it any longer. They manage to get her down in time and call an ambulance, but in her half-conscious state, Eiko mutters something that irrevocably drags both Haruo and Mizuki into this apparent curse. Shirai-san is coming. Now they, too, unfortunately, know her name. This is the crux of the curse. If you hear the story, but you don't know her name, then it has no power. Alternatively, if you only know her name, but not the story that accompanies it, then the story also has no power. But together, they become a powerful curse, like a key that opens a locked door. And as evidenced by Mizuki and Haruo, you don't necessarily even have to hear them together. But once you know both, it's game over. You're now on Shirai-san's radar. And who is Shirai-san? What is this strange curse of hers that spreads through a story? Well, that's what Mizuki and Haruo must now uncover. After discovering that the story came from Solgen Hot Spring, naturally, they decide to take a trip out there and see if they can uncover something that might help road trip. At the same time, Mami Akota and Fuyumi, a husband and wife who recently lost their young daughter in an unfortunate accident, 
are at the cafe where Kana died when Kolta, a freelance writer, decides that the story sounds worthy of an article. He interviews the staff member who was working at the time and does a little digging on, you guessed it, Facebook, and soon uncovers the same thing as Mizuki and Haruo. The three friends from the bookstore took a trip to Solgen Hot Springs and now two of them are dead. Officially from heart attacks, but in both cases, their eyes exploded as well. Weird. He discovers that Eiko, the only remaining survivor, is now in the hospital. But by the time he gets there to interview her, oh no, she has now also died. And you guessed it, it was a heart attack, but her eyes exploded as well. Welp. Only one thing left to do then. Head to Solgen Hot Springs and start digging. It's not long until Kolta runs into Mizuki and Haruo, and they all discover they're there for the same purpose. There's an interesting moment where Kolta fears they're dealing with something viral, and keep in mind this was written pre-pandemic, so he makes sure to keep himself masked, but that is quickly ditched when the duo inform him that it's very much not a virus. Not a traditional one, anyway. The cause of these deaths is apparently a curse that spreads through a story, and being an inquisitive freelance writer, Kota asks them to tell it to him. Curses aren't real, after all. They agree because, of course, and Kota reports his findings back to his wife, who is currently working on a drama script back at home. Naturally, he tells her the story as well. The number of victims in Shirai-san's web continues to grow. The trio continue their investigations, with Kolta heading over to Toshiyuki's house to interview him, while Haruo and Mizuki head over to Watanabe's place of work to see if they can uncover anything. Kolta uncovers something interesting. It appears that Shirai-san can't attack you if you are looking directly at her. She appeared before Toshiyuki, ready to claim him, but he was frozen scared and couldn't take his eyes off her. And, to his surprise, as long as he kept looking at her, she wouldn't move. However, if he looked away and then back again, she would be closer. The key, it seems, is to just keep your eyes on her. Which is, of course, easier said than done. It's also not a cure, because Shirai-san will keep coming. It just means she will give up for that particular night. Hmm. Meanwhile, Mizuki and Haruo discover that Watanabe, the apparent original storyteller, told this story after finding it in an old book of his that he wrote as a child. It seems it was a story he heard from a folklorist, whose house he used to visit a lot as a child. But after writing the story down in his book, he promptly forgot about it, until he dug it up several decades later and reread it. It would appear that seeing the story was enough to jog his memory and, in essence, curse him again. But if the curse spreads through the story and knowing Shirai-san's name, then why didn't he die as a child? Well, like I said, it's explained that he immediately forgot it upon writing it down, so it seems that as long as you can immediately forget her name, then you're all good. Finally, being forgetful comes in clutch. Anyway, it's not long until Shirai-san claims Toshiyuki as well, which means that it's just our four protagonists left who know Shirai-san's story and name. Meaning, one of them will be next. They start looking into who this folklorist was, hitting up local libraries and whatnot, as well as interviewing some elderly folks around town who might know something, and they come up with a few interesting facts. This folklorist, Mizorogi Gen, moved back to his wife's hometown of Y City in F Prefecture in his mid-50s and became interested in the local history. He wrote several books on things like yokai and, in particular, he took an interest in the strange customs of a small village located on the mountain just outside Y City, called Mekakushi Village. Mekakushi means a blindfold or something used to cover the eyes, by the way. For much of this, we switch to Gen's point of view in the past, as he visits a local nursing home and interviews an elderly woman by the name of Ishimori Mibu. Mibu is a fascinating woman. You see, 
She can't remember people's names. Just their names. Her memory otherwise works perfectly fine, but an accident she had when she was younger caused this strange affliction, and I'm sure you already see where this is going. At any rate, Mibu was the only survivor of a pandemic that wiped out her village. Mekakushi village. But according to Mibu, that wasn't what actually wiped her village out. No, it was something far more terrifying. It was a curse. A curse that only she was able to escape from. Over numerous visits, the frail and elderly Mibu retells her story to Gen, who plans to turn it into a book. Due to her affliction, Mibu was not treated so well by the other villagers, to put it politely. Not even by her husband or his family. At some point, they charged Mibu with looking after a prisoner. She had to head to a storehouse on the outskirts of the village each day to feed this prisoner and take care of toiletry sanitation and such. As it turned out, the prisoner in this makeshift jail was none other than a Kitoshi, which we can roughly translate as a type of shaman or faith healer. She was basically a shrine maiden with extra steps, and naturally, Mibu was shocked to find the daughter of arguably the most powerful man in the village being confined like this. Although she wasn't given the full details, it appeared that some soldiers came to visit Mekakushi village shortly before heading out to the Pacific War. You see, this village was famous for its kitoshi and their ability to place curses on people. The soldiers wished to curse their foes before fighting them, but something went wrong and it backfired. As a result, this shrine maiden, as I'll call her for now, was punished with banishment to this storehouse on the outskirts of town. A decision everyone will soon come to regret. Unfortunately for all involved, the Shrine Maiden was pregnant when she was confined. It's uncertain whether anyone else knew about this, but either way, she lost the baby, and it was this event, it seemed, that drove her towards an inevitable conclusion. This powerful Shrine Maiden decided that she would curse the entire village and everyone in it. They would pay for making her lose her child. Not only would they pay, but it seemed that the Shrine Maiden would offer their lives in exchange for her lost child. Yes, there had long been stories of people coming back to life in Mekakushi village, which was where the custom of tying a bell through one's hands after death came from, so that they may ring it if they came back to life. And it seemed the Shrine Maiden had offered their local Kamisama the lives of everyone in the village in exchange for her child. The child they took from her. But how could she do that from the confines of her jail? Well, that was where Mibu came in. Mibu was going to be a messenger for her. Mibu noticed the Shrine Maiden riding something on several of her visits, and as it turned out, this something was a scary story. All Mibu had to do was tell it to the other villagers. That was it. But once she did that, she should get the hell out of town, because the entire village was going to be wiped out. There was one problem with all of this, of course. The story required Mibu to reveal a name, and she couldn't remember names. Not to worry. The Shrine Maiden wrote the entire story down on paper for her, including the name. All she had to do was read it. That's it. Easy peasy, no need to remember anything at all. And so, Mibu did exactly what the Shrine Maiden asked of her, because during their time together, she had become quite fond of her. And although she wasn't sure how, at some point, the Shrine Maiden seemed to have done something so that her husband and his family grew afraid of chastising Mibu, and instead, treated her politely and almost with great fear. She had to repay her for that favour, and reading a story seemed like the least she could do. Naturally, it went exactly as you would expect. Mibu first told the story to her husband and his family, and because bored villagers do love scary stories to liven the day up, it quickly spread through the village like wildfire. And then, soon, 
the deaths followed. Nobody was quite sure what was going on, and they all blamed an unknown illness, but people's eyes kept exploding upon death, and this illness spared no one. No one except Mibu, that is. It was during this time that Mibu visited the storehouse, slash jail, one day, and found the shrine maiden dead. It was unclear how she died, but she was buried according to the village's traditions. A piece of red string was looped through her hands and attached to a bell. Mibu was certain she could hear the bell ringing, even as her body was cremated, but the sound soon stopped. Not long after this, Mibu took the opportunity to escape and ran to the town at the foot of the mountain. There, she took refuge at Solgen Hot Springs and told them about this horrible illness sweeping through her village. Several men visited Mekakushi village and, upon their return, confirmed that the entire village had been wiped out. Mibu was the only survivor. She took up work at the hot spring, and then one night, something amazing happened. Mibu woke up to find a baby by her pillow. The apparent ghost of the shrine maiden informed her that it was her, the shrine maiden's, baby. The mountain Kamisama had granted her wish. However, being that the shrine maiden was now dead, the baby needed a new mother to raise them, and naturally, that would be Mibu. Nobody quite believed Mibu when she informed them that she woke up and there was a newborn on her pillow, but at the same time, nobody could find any signs that the baby didn't just magically materialize there either. Weird. Mibu ended up raising the child, and that, it seemed, was the end of Mekakushi village and the mysterious curse of Shirai-san. Except obviously it wasn't, because now, in our time, her story is spreading again. Mizuki, Haruo, and Kota decide to head to the now abandoned Mekakushi village to see if they can uncover any clues there. This is easier said than done because the village was difficult to get to even when it still existed, and nobody has been there since the war. If they can even locate it, they'll no doubt have to drive up the mountain as far as they can and then get out and walk the rest of the way. But we are in a horror story, and it's not meant to be. The trio discuss what they know on the drive up, and they discover something fascinating. Shirai-san attacks without fail every three days. And according to their calculations, that means that Shirai-san is going to attack today. It's either going to be Fuyumi back in Tokyo, or one of these three in the car. The odds are sadly in their favor, and as expected, Shirai-san comes for one of them. Kota sees his dead daughter standing in the middle of the road and crashes the car to avoid her. This does quite a number on them and knocks all three unconscious as they collide with a tree. Mizuki is the first to wake up, but she's unable to free either of the men from the car and none of their phones have reception either. She's going to have to walk back to the road and hope for a passerby to help. Yet it's not long until she's assaulted by Kana's voice behind her and Shirai-san in front of her. She knows it's a trap, but whether it's the real Kana behind her or an illusion created by Shirai-san to fool her remains unclear. Either way, she has to keep her eyes ahead of her if she doesn't want to die, and soon she's joined by Haruo, who has thankfully woken up. He can see Shirai-san too, but he hears his brother calling to him instead. As it turns out, if you've been cursed by Shirai-san, regardless of whether she's coming for you in particular or not, you can still see her. And when the beast can be kept in check simply by looking at her, there is strength in numbers. One person can turn away and as long as the other is still looking at her, she can't move. The pair are able to ride it out and Shirai-san disappears back into the other. No prey for her today. If their predictions are correct, then this means they are safe for another three days before she shows up again. Help eventually arrives, and Kota is taken to a hospital back in Tokyo. He's alive, but in a bad way. Haruo and Mizuki are also injured, but otherwise okay. 
During this time at the hospital, Mizuki has a strange dream. She sees a beautiful woman behind bars, surrounded by Shinto charms, although the woman herself also appears to be a shrine maiden. A tiny skeleton lays on the floor before this woman, and as her breath catches at the sight, the shrine maiden turns around. Their eyes meet for just a moment, and then Mizuki wakes up. Now, if you've seen the movie, this is roughly where the story ends, with a few differences to wrap the story up. But the book has an entirely different ending, and it's by far the one I prefer. We have a brief jump of a few weeks, and as it turns out, someone leaked the story of Shirai-san onto the internet. An unknown party shared her story on an anonymous bulletin board, like a Koabana story, and now it has spread far and wide. People all over the country are mysteriously dying every few days, their hearts seeming to just stop and their eyes exploding upon death. Shirai-san becomes a bona fide urban legend known all over the country. Considering that her curse spreads by knowing her name and story, this is the worst possible outcome. Who did this and why? As it turns out, Fuyumi shared the story with some of her fellow riders at a meeting for the drama she was working on shortly after her husband told it to her. They didn't believe it to be true, after all, and it was a neat little story. By the time they discovered that it was real, it was too late, and shortly after that, the story found its way onto the internet. Who posted it remains a mystery, but at this point, it doesn't matter. Now, it's out there. And the more people that read it, the more people are going to die. Mizuki and Haruo come up with a plan. The key to the curse lies in two parts. Knowing Shirai-san's name, and knowing the story that accompanies it. They can't stop people from knowing her name, it's far too late for that. But they can muddy the waters with fake stories. And that's exactly what they do. They post fake stories daily on anonymous forums, hoping against hope that more people will read the fake stories and that, by posting the name Shirai-san so much, people will get fed up and not try to look into the legend anymore. Basically, kill the curse by overexposure, leading to a lack of interest and letting it fade away naturally. But of course, nothing ever truly disappears from the internet. And whether they like it or not, there are still people out there finding and reading the real story, thus adding themselves to Shirai-san's long list of victims. But for whatever reason, she still only kills once every three days. And so, with so many victims to choose from, nobody is quite sure when it will be their turn, leading many to believe that it really is just an urban legend after all. At least until she suddenly shows up for them at school, or work, or in dark alleys. After getting out of the hospital, Kota is once again determined to visit Mikakushi village to see if they can uncover something there to help them get out of this whole mess. After all, it's not like they're off the hook now. All four of them are still cursed. Now, they're just in a bigger pool of victims for Shirai-san to pick from. And after finally making his way there, he uncovers at least part of the horrifying truth. The reason Shirai-san kills only once every three days is, ironically, a rather logical reason. It takes her one day to find and bring her victim back to the mountain. It takes her one day to cross over a lake that shouldn't exist, and yet does, right on the edge of Mekakushi village and then another day for her to come back. Three days total. Shidai-san can only bring back one victim every three days because of travel time. Huh. Kolta spots Shidai-san bringing back a victim, a teenage boy he recognises as her latest kill from the news on the internet. He snaps pictures of her bringing the defeated man to a boat on the edge of the lake. He soon realises that boat is full of spirits of her victims, including Kana and Kozuto. They all sit there listless as Shirai-san loads yet another on board. 
Why she's keeping them in the boat is a mystery, and one Coulter will never solve. He soon hears the ringing of a bell, and realises he didn't hide quite as well as he thought he did. Seems the three-day rule doesn't matter when you're in her territory. Shirai-san claims another victim, and Coulter's eyes explode. A short time after his death, Mizuki and Haruo visit Fuyumi to pay their respects and see how she's doing. Technically, Kota is considered missing, but Fuyumi believes him to be dead, a victim of Shirai-san's curse. The pair hear somebody in another room, and Fuyumi reveals that she's looking after a relative's child, so they'll have to keep this short. As they leave, Mizuki notices a photo of Fuyumi's family nearby. Strangely, the elderly woman in it looks somewhat familiar to her. Fuyumi says that it's her great-grandmother, and though it bugs her a little as to why this woman looks familiar, the pair leave. That, seemingly, is the end of the story. But it's in the epilogue that everything finally gets tied together with a pretty little bow. Gen goes to visit Mibu for one of his usual visits, but this time around it's not a nursing home staff member that wheels her out, but rather her granddaughter. The woman hangs around while they do their interview, but when it's time to go, she chases Gen down and hands him something. It's a sheet of paper that her grandmother asked her to find and give to him. She tried reading it herself, but the characters are too messy and old. All she knows is that it's definitely her grandmother's handwriting. Gen reads the piece of paper and realises what he has in his hands. This is it. This is the story Mibu has been telling him about. The story of the being that wiped out Mekakushi village. The story that curses you once you know the being's name. So it was all true then. But that doesn't make any sense. Mibu said that the Shrine Maiden wrote the story and then gave it to her. Yet this woman just told him that it was her grandmother's handwriting. The woman then asks him if her grandmother also told him the lie about finding a baby by her pillow. Gen is terribly confused, and the woman reveals that it's a crazy story she likes to tell, but Nibu was very much pregnant with her mother and gave birth to her the regular way. She didn't wake up with a baby on her pillow given to her by a dead shrine maiden. Gen remarks that she does indeed look a lot like her grandmother, so that seems unlikely. Huh. At any rate, Gen takes the story home and sets about deciphering the messy characters written on it. Finally, he sees the apparently long-lost name, the key to the curse. It has three characters. The characters for death, come, and mountain. He surmises it must be read as Shirai-san, and this being must work for the mountain Kamisama that was once worshipped at Mekakushi village. Outside, he sees a young Watanabe playing, and asks the boy if he'd like to hear a scary story. Fade to black. So what does all this mean? The story doesn't answer every question it poses nor does it outright tell you what's going on. You're given more than enough clues to figure it out though, so let's take a look. This is something that, if you've only seen the movie, you would sadly miss. The movie almost entirely removed the Shrine Maiden character, and thus the explanation of what exactly the curse was and how it escaped into the wild. In the book, it's all spelt out, you just have to piece it together yourself. The key lies in the characters of Mibu and Fuyumi. There's some double deception going on here. Mibu presents herself as the only survivor of Mekakushi village, the woman who was tasked with looking after the nameless shrine maiden and helping her to spread the story, when in reality, Mibu was the shrine maiden. The part about her not being able to remember names was manufactured to explain how she was able to escape. Now obviously, Mibu is an unreliable narrator, considering that she was the Shrine Maiden all along and didn't want anyone to know that. 
Inevitably, this would lead to her lying about many things. How much of her story was real, and how much was fake, will never be known. We can assume, however, that the Mibu from the story actually was a real person, just like she claimed to be, and what she told Gen was, for the most part, the truth. Where the Shrine Maiden, now posing as Mibu, may have fudged the details would be, of course, when it came to the real Mibu and her fate. It's unlikely the real Mibu had a problem remembering names, and so she also died when she helped spread the Shrine Maiden's story. The Shrine Maiden then needed a good cover story when she escaped, and so she took on the role of Mibu, the woman who had been looking after her all that time. Mibu also claimed until her death that she woke up one day and the Shrine Maiden's baby was on her pillow. This was proven to be lies, because Mibu was actually pregnant and gave birth normally. This is confirmed by everyone from the town at the foot of the mountain who was around her at the time. Her daughter and her granddaughter also looked just like her, which would be incredibly unlikely if they weren't related. So, Mibu actually was the Shrine Maiden, and she kept the story she wrote on a piece of paper somewhere at home. As a Kitoshi, a shaman, she created this curse to get her baby back. Remember, there had long been stories of people being revived in Mekakushi village, which was how the tradition of the bell through the hand started. As a Kitoshi, this maiden essentially had a direct line to the mountain Kamisama, and she was so angry that her child died while she was in confinement that she offered the entire village in exchange for the mountain Kamisama giving her baby back. And the Kamisama agreed. Shidai-san is essentially the go-between. She works for the Kamisama by heading across the lake separating the realms, finding and killing the victim, and then bringing their spirit back, a trip that takes three days in total. Less if you happen to live right next to the lake though, and the curse wipes the entire village out in short order. The Shrine Maiden then escapes to the town at the foot of the mountain, to the Solgen Hot Spring in particular, and by the time she gets there, the Kamisama has granted her wish. She's pregnant once more with the baby that previously died. She gets her second chance, and all it took was offering up the entirety of the village that kept her locked up in return. Who the father is remains unknown, and the story never once even hints at who it might be. Then we have Fuyumi, Mibu's great-granddaughter. Throughout the story, we are told that Fuyumi came from Y City, and how her husband finds it interesting that this legend comes from his wife's hometown. The big hint comes at the end, when Mizuki sees the photo of Fuyumi's great-grandmother, an elderly woman sitting in a wheelchair, who looks like someone she thinks she's seen before, but can't place where. Mizuki had a dream at the hospital of the Shrine Maiden and saw her face. But she was, of course, young in the dream. This is why she can't precisely place it at the time, and it's not until later that she realises, oh crap, now I know where I recognised her from. That was the woman from my dream. Fuyumi also reveals to them that her maiden name was Ishimori, which means nothing to the characters, but means something to us, the readers, who know that Mibu's last name was also Ishimori. Fuyumi's great-grandmother was the Shrine Maiden who made a deal with the Mountain Kamisama, her entire village in exchange for the return of her dead daughter. This is where yet another hint is hidden in plain sight. The story ends with an unknown party having posted Shirai-san's story on the internet. This unleashes her curse on the country at large. Kota and Fuyumi lost a daughter in a tragic accident. Fuyumi was physically unable to have any more children, and so this girl was their only chance at having a child. When Haruo and Mizuki visit her house, they hear a child in another room. As they're leaving, Mizuki notices it's a young girl, although she never sees her face. Who could it possibly be? Of course, it's Fuyumi's daughter, which means that Fuyumi was the one who posted the story on the internet. 
She claimed she only shared it with a few other riders at a meeting, but when you read between the lines, it's likely that Huyumi remembered the story her great-grandmother told of the shrine maiden from Mekakushi village, and her deal with the devil, so to speak, to get her child back. And so, like her great-grandmother, Fuyumi did the same. She offered the spirits of any and all who read the story on the internet in exchange for the return of her daughter. And just like with her shrine maiden great-grandmother, the mountain Kamisama agreed. Fuyumi lost her husband, yes, but she got her beloved daughter back. And now Shidai-san has been unleashed upon a mostly unsuspecting populace able to claim at least one victim every three days, for as long as people know her story and her name. Considering the internet, it's unlikely that story will ever disappear, leaving the story to end on a somewhat grim, foreboding note. Now, not everything is fully explained. As I just mentioned, the father of the Shrine Maiden's baby is never once mentioned, and ultimately doesn't seem to matter to the story. Why the ritual failed and why her family put her in this jail is never mentioned either. And the story ends with no hints being given as to how this curse could be broken, if it even can. All our surviving main characters are still cursed, and although they have valiantly fought to dilute Shidai-san's story so that nobody else gets dragged into her curse, it's clear that the story is still out there and people are still finding it. Shirai-san is here to stay. When Kota visits Mekakushi village at the end, he sees the spirits that Shirai-san has collected, all sitting on a boat as well. This particular sighting is never explained. Why are they all sitting there? What is Shirai-san, or the mountain Kamisama, going to do with them? Why doesn't she unload them to make room for more? What is she going to do now that she has seemingly endless victims to pick from? That boat is going to get real squishy soon. This is something that's just never explained. There's also one aspect of Shirai-san's powers that's left up to reader interpretation. It's explained that when she starts to haunt a person, she will haunt them for several days before she actually arrives, and her victims will smell the stench of rotting fish, likely an artifact of the lake, but potentially because fish were also used in the Kitoshi's rituals. This is not explained, but either way, she arrives with a fishy stench and causes several hauntings around her victim. She can make her victims hear the voices of the dead who were once close to them, and she can even make them appear before her victims too. However, whether this is really the spirit of the dead person in question, or whether it's an illusion cooked up by Shirai-san, is never explained. The characters even briefly discuss this in the story, with Mizuki unsure and, ultimately, able to accept either explanation. If it really was Kana haunting her, then that would suck because it would mean that she's not able to rest on the other side. But at the same time, if it was really her, then she at least had one final chance to apologise to her and say goodbye. And if it wasn't Kana, then Sure, she didn't really have a chance to say goodbye, but it does mean that she's hopefully at rest. Here the reader is allowed to decide for themselves which explanation they prefer. When it comes to Shirai-san herself, however, just about everything about her is explained somewhere. She appears as a woman with incredibly large creepy eyes, and her victims die with their eyes bursting open. There's a good reason this happens. The Kitoshi, the Shrine Maiden, would use chickens in her rituals and she would crush their eyes. If you watch the movie, which was directed by Otsuichi, the actual writer, then you would have noticed that Shirai-san's eyes looked huge and somewhat chicken-like. Either way, there's a connection between the ritual the Kitoshi used to perform and people's eyes also exploding on the moment of death. Shirai-san also wears a white kimono, reminiscent of what the deceased are buried in, in Mekakushi village, and the same goes for the red string that is looped through the hands with a bell tied to it. The purpose of this bell is to allow the apparently deceased person to ring in case they're not actually dead. It seemed that 
not everyone who dies in Mekakushi stays dead. And so this is a measure they have taken to hopefully make sure they don't unnecessarily burn or bury anyone who, for whatever reason, either isn't dead or somehow comes back to life. And as I mentioned earlier, the three day intervals between Shirai-san's attacks are because that's her travel time to and from the mountain. We're given an incredibly subtle hint, before we even know that it's a hint, that Fuyumi's deal with the Kami-sama was also accepted. Kolta remarks that he can see a girl on the other side of the lake, and he feels that she looks familiar, but she's too far away for him to really get a good look at her, and he dies before his camera can focus on her. This is likely his and Fuyumi's daughter, who Shirai-san is about to transport back from the other side, in exchange for all the souls she's loading and will continue to load into her boat. Finally, we get the explanation for her name at the end. For many, the name undoubtedly sounds like Shirai-san, with the name being Shirai, followed by the polite suffix San, like Mr. or Ms. Shirai. But it's not that at all. It's a combination of the characters for death, come, and mountain, which when put together could potentially be read as Shirai-san. Here, the exact meaning of this combination of characters allows room for interpretation though. It could mean, literally, death comes from the mountain. But I've also seen Japanese readers theorize that perhaps it actually means Shibito ga Kuruyama, the mountain which the dead come to. Either way, both work, and this is the actual meaning behind her name. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one more thing about this novel. If aspects of the story sounded scarily similar to another, far more famous Japanese horror story, then you're certainly not alone. If you squeeze this book into a dense, condensed form, then it's almost a reimagining of Ring, but if written by Otsuichi, for the modern age, and sprinkled with just a dash of Fatal Frame. Let me explain. The story begins with a group of teenagers who take a trip to a hot spring. There, they partake in a cursed piece of media, although they are unaware of it at the time. And roughly a week later, they start dying. Then we have a man and a woman who are involved with the now dead teenagers, forced to step in once they are also cursed and fight to uncover what is going on before it claims them too. They head to the location of the crime and dig into local history and discover the story of a powerful woman with potentially supernatural powers who was greatly wronged and apparently killed. But from beyond the grave she got her revenge and now that curse is spreading indiscriminately through technology, claiming any it comes into contact with. I could be describing either story here. It gets even more on the nose when you realise that Mizuki's last name is Yamamura, much like Sadako's, and Haruo's last name is Suzuki, much like Suzuki Koji, the man behind Sadako. Otsuichi also went on to work with Nakata Hideo, director of the Ring movies, shortly after writing this book. There's no denying that he was heavily inspired by the now classic tale when he put this story together, but you would be straight out lying to claim that the story is a straight adaption as well. If you listen to the story explanation then you would notice how different it gets. It's just that the story beats and some of the early details appear to match Ring beat for beat. If we move that story into the modern time with modern technology, changed things up to make the original victim more akin to someone involved in a failed fatal frame ritual that is still affecting things now, and then asked Otsuichi to write it, well, this is what you'd get, and it's fantastic. And so, here's the review part of this video. Should you read this book, assuming you can read Japanese or assuming that they actually release this in English somewhere down the line, and I sure hope they do. Well yes, of course. <laughs> if you couldn't tell by the length of this video alone, I absolutely adore this book. It instantly became one of my favourites, even before I finished it, 
but I found the ending so satisfying that it truly solidified the book as one of my all-time favourites by the time I was done. If you like Ring, if you like internet creepypastas, if you like the type of old Japanese folklore you might find in a Fatal Frame game, well then this is the story for you, and those three things just happen to be three of my favourite things ever. So, I was kind of contractually bound to love this one from the start. The lore behind Shidai-san and the Shrine Maiden from Mekakuji Village were easily my favourite parts of the story, and once I got to them, I found myself unable to put it down until the chapter ended and moved back to the main characters in the present. It's so well thought out, and so well explained that, while it's not outright stated most of the time, it's clear enough what's going on and you can piece the mystery together yourself. You get to feel smart and satisfied when you understand how it all comes together, like you yourself are the folklorist, and you finally put the last piece of the mysterious puzzle in place. If you're studying Japanese, I'd also recommend Otsuichi's books in general if you're looking for reading material. He's certainly not for beginners, but the first book I ever read entirely in Japanese was an Otsuichi book, and his style in general tends towards simplified grammar and easy to read sentences. The same can be found here, with some sections of the book composed of nothing but short snappy dialogue and sentences that you can easily zoom through at an intermediate level. But then other stuff will get more detailed, so naturally your mileage will vary. At any rate, if you're studying and looking for some native material, you could always do far worse than Otsuichi. I'll leave a link in the pinned comment to the book on Amazon Japan if you want to check it out for yourself. And that was our very long look at Shirai-san, one of my favourite books from one of my favourite authors. What did you guys think of this one? Have you seen the movie? Let me know in the comments below and let's get a bit of discussion going. I'll see you again next time.